how did you come to take over the Halley Orchestra? Well, this <coughs> story has been told a few times in, in the history of the Halley. But it really started, you know, I was in America when the war broke out. And I, I couldn't get home, of course. And in 1942, I was really desperate. I, my family was here, my mother. And out of the blue came this cable from the Halley. So would I be interested in the reconstruction of the Halley Orchestra? Now, without waiting for many details, I said to Evelyn, I said, this is it. We're going home. And then I had a very interesting correspondence, which had been published in Michael Kennedy's book on the Halley. And I came home expecting to find an orchestra of at least 70 players. But I did find, when I got home, a lot of the people they thought would have left the BBC, because they'd been taken over by the North. It's a long story, I won't bore you with that. I found I had 26 players. And in a space of about five weeks, I was supposed to start the season with a full symphony orchestra. Anybody who knows the difficulties under which I had to proceed, the whole country was mobilized, male and female, and we immediately announced auditions, which lasted six, seven hours a day. And I had to look for people which were, I'd say, were partially maimed. That means that they couldn't get into the services. But for instance, a chap with flat feet might have very good fingers. So there's nothing wrong about that. And sometimes it was very depressing to go through a whole day and find nothing. And then there were days of rejoicing where the most remarkable talent came to light. For instance, my first flute, Oliver Bannister, who's now been pinched from him by Covent Garden, his first flute, Covent Garden. He was then 16. Came, never played in an orchestra, and one of the great flute players of our time. And, and we had many remarkable instances. A girl who was a school teacher, who was a splendid horn player, and she's still in the orchestra. And I couldn't find the first horn anywhere till Ildre Golance's daughter came along. And she became the first horn. <coughs> the first trombone I found out at the, at the Hippodrome or something in Manchester. A marvellous player. Never heard of symphonies. I you know the opening the last move to the Brahms, where there's a top A, but the most professional symphony players that tremble about that. To him, that was an A like any other A. He played it, you know, for George Roby, so he played for, for Brahms. It didn't make any difference. <laughs> but one of the funniest instances I remember, a dear old boy who came to the double bass audition. He was a rather attractive chap, and he'd hardly play at all. Isn't he? But we had a good time. So I made one of the test pieces, it always the skirts of the Beethoven. So we had to go at that. He put his hand down, and he left it. He just, he never moved I mean, He moved, moved the bow. He's always playing the same note. <laughs> so we had a good laugh over that. Then I made him play the solo from a terror, which has that frightful jump from the E flat to the C flat. Da -de -da -de. And the distance on the bass is quite all that, you see. So I said, have you heard that? So he went, the, 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 the. I said, it's further up than that. So he went a bit further. No, I said, it's further than that. And at last, I took hold of the bass, and I played this to him. And he said, up there? Oh, wish I'd been, <laughs> never been up there before. <laughs> so they compensated quite a lot of what we had to go through. Well, to cut the long story short, we did find an auction. And we opened in Bradford, and it wasn't a few months before the orchestra was being quoted as an example to some of the existing orchestras, because they'd taken this, you know, with tremendous seriousness, 
And that is what is now known as the legend of the Hal Do you find that conditions here nowadays favor the very thorough preparation of perhaps the editing of great musical masterpieces? Oh, yes, and that's one of the main reasons why I've remained here. You see, an orchestra which has a permanent conductor, and some of you may not realize that I'm only the fourth permanent conductor of the Halley in 107 years of history. 1958, what is that? This is 107 years of history. Because an orchestra which has acquired a style, you see, a conductor can't leave anything behind him like a composer. Almost the only thing he can leave is an orchestra which has a real tradition and a style of play. Now, you may like that, you may dislike it, but anybody who hears the Halley when I'm conducting knows it's the Halley. And there's very little of that today because of these semi-permanent conditions. And as I think I was telling you, Charles, the other day, you see, we have, a, they have an enormous repertoire which always needs touching up in certain places, like a quartet that plays together. But it leaves, if I have a great work to prepare, like a big new, huge Mahler symphony, we, we always place it at a period when we are playing more or less standard repertory. So it's, the orchestra is not let off rehearsal because of the standard repertory. It's called for the same number of rehearsals which are used for this work they're preparing. And it has twofold. It, it keeps them busy and gives them the incentive of preparing something they've never heard or played before. So, see, this really permanent orchestra has tremendous advantages, both musically and morally, I think. Because the standards uh, keep creeping up, and that's when you begin to feel dissatisfied. <laughs>